we continue with this theme and take a look at the inner workings of polygamous marriages and some of the rights uh, that are contained for people who enter into polygamous marriages. We're joined by customary law expert and lecturer Zama Mubai. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us this afternoon. So in the case or in the absence of a will or in this case where a will is disputed, how can wives claim from the state of their late husband in a polygamous marriage? Thank you, Dudu, and uh, good afternoon to your viewers. Well, how can wives claim from uh, the estate of their polygamous marriages in an event where maybe the husband passes away? That is all determined by the, the type of marriage um, involved and the registration of such marriages. S say in this case where there is a mixture uh, we call it dual marriages. There's a mixture of customary marriages and civil marriages in one polygamous household. The, the type of marriage involved uh, would have to take precedent. Where there is a civil marriage, in fact, either way, we have to look first at the time in which uh, either of the marriages were entered into because the timeline, as we overemphasize, the timeline is very important. If the civil marriage came first and at a particular time, uh, in this case, I understand that a civil marriage was entered into before 1988 and obviously before the Sitole case, which I think was decided last year. That now has a very significant implication because such a civil marriage in this instance of the, of the first wife, uh, by virtue that it was a marriage between uh, black persons, it was out of community of property. Now that would mean something to the estate. But in this case, because of the Sitole judgment, which happened just before Isilose Kotram, it changed a lot of things. But then um, it will still have a certain implication to what we have at hand. But then to give you a general under, uh, understanding pertaining to your question, where there is a conflict between a civil marriage and a customary marriage, the court will need to check which marriage came first because that would mean a lot on the, the claim of the subsequent wife. And then in a case where it's just purely customary marriages, all marriages are customary marriages, that also takes a different uh, turn um, if the customary marriage is the polygamous marriage, um, the husband married his wives before the commencement of the new of the customary marriages act, the recognition of customary marriages act. If such marriages were entered into before that act, then they are now in communal property. I know it can be a little bit complicated for one to even imagine how does two or more people. Um, how do two or more people actually be, how, how is it possible that they can be in a polygamous marriage? But that's what the courts have decided and that's what um, the acts say. And it, it makes quite a lot of sense that it can be so because of the changes that have happened. But in a case where the subsequent wives or the polygamous marriage itself happened after the year 2000. Now that is when now the issue, there is this particular contract that needs to be entered into between the husband and his wives. And that is the contract that now will determine who gets what, whose share is for who, and that would, it will ideally resolve some of the conundrums that we, we have when we deal with customary marriages. But as you would know, we to do is that most people, uh, they do not even have such a contract, which by the way, the absence of such contract as the courts would have it would not even uh, invalidate the subsequent customary marriage, that is the second wife going forward. 
but that's a matter for another day. Mm. As we heard we from that, Judge uh, Madondo Memubai um, saying that uh, Mrs. Zulu is the undisputed, you know, heir to the throne, um, there are other traditional kingdoms, if you will, in uh, South Africa where you have chiefs and uh, etc. Uh, but when it comes to the question of this particular case, um, the issue of Queen Mantombi Lamini, you spoke of the significance of timelines, but then there's also that issue issue of royal blood with royal blood, which then produces the heir to the throne. How much does that complicate the matter for otherwise? It doesn't, and it shouldn't complicate the matter. As it is, with this uh, particular case, it should be straightforward, and I, I, I do concur with the judge that the issue of the marriages between the, the late king and his wives has no bearing whatsoever to the successor to the throne. Well, it, it, it might come a little bit strange to other cultures that a, a successor could be nominated through a will, but it all depends on, 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 on the royal family, how they actually uh, do their succession. But according to customary law, I know it might sound a little bit strange that the successor could be nominated through a will, but that is all up to the family. So the issue of the marriages of the king and the successor and the property involved, these are uh, issues that don't have any uh, bearing on one another, that if one marriage is valid and another is not valid, therefore uh, the successor or the coronation cannot proceed. No, it, it, it does not have any bearing whatsoever. The royal family, rather, is the one that has the power to identify the successor according to their customs. In this case, apparently, it's according to the will. And the issue of the estate, the distribution of property, is one matter on another hand. Thank you very much. Zama Mubai is a customary law expert and lecturer.